One sudden slip along a desolate canyon trail puts world champion adventure athlete Danel Balenji at the mercy of the Utah wilderness. I was in the middle of nowhere and nobody knew where I was. Her legs useless, she's forced to crawl for every inch to try and escape the unforgiving desert. I thought I was gonna die. But she'll also need the help of her best friend. Go! If she's to win this ultimate survival test. <laughs> the battle for her own life. Buy me help. <laughs> My last chance. <laughs> Danelle Balenji is a super athlete. In triathlon and endurance sports, her reputation is legendary. Several times national and world champion. It's no wonder she's just earned the title US Athlete of the Year for the sixth time. For Danelle, Giving up is not an option, as paramedic John Marshall is about to discover. My first meeting of Danelle, she just ran 60 miles across open desert in 115 degree temperature before she got to the checkpoint that I was working at. This small framed woman comes into the med booth. Her feet are blistered. She's completely dehydrated, somewhat delirious. And I said, hey, we highly recommend we start an IV in you, get some fluids back in you. You're gonna need this. No, uh, just a drink and some duct tape. This kind of sets the mode for my involvement with Danelle. I learned that this girl, right from the get-go, was as hard as nails. This was a true athlete to the, the fullest extent. They say to be a great adventure athlete, first and foremost, you have to be hard to kill. Danelle was hard to kill. It was December 13th, 2006, and um, I was at my house in Moab. The winter season was approaching, and. I was wanting to get in shape for the snowshoe racing season and also to compete in some winter triathlons. Oh, hey Tess, give me a minute, okay? Just give me a minute. <laughs> so I was to head out on about a two or two and a half hour run and I kind of had one of my favorite loops in mind. I hadn't done this loop in a while. Okay, all right. Okay, I get the message. <laughs> all right, let's go. <laughs> One of the world's premier extreme sports athletes, Donnell is known for staggering feats of endurance in adventure racing. Single and living alone, her constant companion is her dog, Taz. I got Taz from a puppy rescue. I remember going to the shelter and there were several puppies there. This one puppy sort of st stood out. because he was energetic and he liked to run around and he was hyper and he had this real playful uh, attitude about him that I liked. I sort of connected with that. Look at this one. Oh, you're cute. Oh. And I remember some other lady went up to Taz and was holding him. And I looked at this lady and I, that's my dog. And he wasn't my dog just yet, you know, but I just knew that he was the one. And then I, so I kind of kept an eye on this lady while she was playing with Taz. And as soon as she set him down, I snatched him up and said, I want this one. There was something that drew me to Taz, that, that I knew that he was the one for me. With Taz for company, 
Donnell is planning a routine training run through Moab's backcountry. It's a beautiful but rugged wilderness where few people ever go. It was a sunny day, but it was cool, probably temperatures in the 30s, around 30 degrees Fahrenheit. I had my kayak on top of my truck, hopefully planning on going kayaking later that afternoon. I didn't see any bikers or hikers out, just myself and Taz. Come on, Taz. I brought my water bottle. At the last minute, I thought, well, I'll grab this little waste pack so I don't have to carry the water bottle in my hand. That way I could just put the water bottle in the waste pack. And it was a small waste pack with two zipper pockets. I didn't know what was in those pockets. I just um, grabbed it and whatever was in there from my previous run was in my uh, waste pack. And um, I headed out on the run. Let's go. I had absolutely no idea that my life was going to completely change that day. Come on, boy. Despite its beauty, the backcountry surrounding Moab can be hostile and dangerous. Just in the last month, two men have fallen victim to the deadly terrain, found frozen to death in the bitter desert night. Search and rescue teams are called out regularly to save hikers in distress. But Donnell is fearless. Six times the winner of US Athlete of the Year, she thrives on pushing herself to the limit in the most extreme environments. I was actually in pretty, pretty good physical condition that I usually could push myself right to that, to that limit of pain, but not quite go over it. It actually almost feels good, like you get into the rhythm, get into the flow. Donnell's training route is not marked on any map. And with every step, she's heading further into uncharted territory. All of a sudden, the, the next thing I know, Taz was ahead of me, and my foot slipped out from under me. almost immediately knew that I was in trouble because I couldn't stop. And I was moving fast at that point. And then the last 20 feet were an overhang. Free fall. I definitely had time to see my life kind of spin through my head and, and think about maybe I wasn't gonna see another day. And then, boom. Oh my god, I'm still alive. I didn't know what I had done to myself, but I knew I had hurt myself pretty bad. It's a horrendous fall. The impact has shattered Donnell's pelvis into pieces, leaving her skeleton severed in two. There's nothing but soft tissue connecting her legs to the rest of her body. Super athlete Donnell goes into survival mode. Somehow my brain didn't allow itself to think too deeply about what had happened. Despite her terrible injuries, Donnell's endurance training kicks in and she's determined to keep moving. So what I did is I took my, my right hand and put it on my right leg and my left hand and put it on my left leg and I could feel my legs. And so I knew that I wasn't paralyzed. And my next reaction was, I gotta get out of this canyon. I gotta get back to my truck and I gotta get, I gotta get home or I gotta get to the hospital. Incredibly, despite her shattered pelvis, the endurance athlete tries to stand up and run out of the canyon. Oh. 
but with her skeleton effectively in two, Danelle's legs cannot support her body. Unable to walk or run, she's facing her worst nightmare. Her legs useless, she's alone on a ledge, separated from her dog, Taz. Danelle is stranded in a thousand square miles of barren, uninhabited wilderness. I knew that I needed to get out of that canyon. The temperatures were cold, and it was the middle of winter. But I couldn't stand up, I couldn't walk. So I just started dragging myself. With her skeleton broken in two, shattered at the pelvis, Danelle is critically injured. Most people would be in agony, but super fit athlete Danelle is experiencing an enormous adrenaline surge, masking the pain. But the problem for Danelle now is which direction to go. She's no idea if there's a safe way down from the ledge. Taz comes to Danelle's rescue. Taz, there you are. Taz has found a way back through the canyon to reach her. She is no longer alone. But Taz's appearance brings more than comfort. Since he had gotten to where I landed, I knew that there was a route out. So I used him as my guide and kind of dragged myself where he went um, along the shelf and then back down to the bottom of the canyon. With incredible determination, Danelle follows Taz to the bottom of the canyon and now plans to pull herself back to her truck. But as the adrenaline surge wears off, the pain is starting to take a hold. It would take all my energy to sort of drag myself an inch. And, uh, and then I would, the pain would be so bad, I would have to regroup and try it again. Time is working against Danelle. She knows the dangers of this remote wilderness. And that if she doesn't reach safety by nightfall, the sub-zero temperatures could kill her. With her energy slipping away, Danelle remembers her waste pack. Oh. I didn't know what was in that waste pack because I didn't check before I left. And, um, and one of them was a little gel pack, sugar pack, um, that endurance athletes often bring with them to help provide energy for running. Eating the gel provides Danelle with a much needed boost, as well as a moment to reflect on the colossal task she's taking on. But her progress is excruciatingly slow. At one point I looked back at my tracks and I could just see where I dragged myself through this canyon. It took me probably two and a half hours just to get to the bottom, dragging myself inch by inch. The canyon that took me maybe two or three minutes to, to walk up. The only comfort Danelle has is her dog's constant companionship. Taz was with me this whole time. I think he probably realized that I was injured. I think he was kind of wondering why I was going so slow. As the winter sun sets, the temperature is dropping below freezing. Daylight is fading fast, and with it, any chances of getting out of the canyon before nightfall. Despite Danelle's superhuman efforts, She's far from safety. Too tired to go on, she stops for the night. But she knows that this desert has a habit of claiming victims in the hours of darkness.
It, it was comforting having Taz there. And I also knew that if there was to be, a, say, a coyote or something that was to come into the canyon, that he would, he would bark and, and scare any wild animals away. But Taz's presence won't save her from the bitter cold of the savage desert night. With the injuries to my midsection, it was a little bit uncomfortable if he got too close to me, because it would kind of move my bones around. I was really hopeful that I was going to make it out of there or that somebody was going to get me. I should have realized right then that I was about to die and that I was in the middle of nowhere and nobody knew where I was. With hours to go before dawn, the temperature is already well below freezing, and it's still falling. It was bone chilling. You know, it'd be like laying in a freezer. Um, my feet were frozen and they got frostbit. Exposure to the cold is causing Danelle's body to shut off the blood supply to her extremities to protect her vital inner organs. Frostbite could claim her fingers and toes but it's only the first stage in the onset of hypothermia. I know that once you start to get too cold, then the brain will shut down, which is a symptom of hypothermia. With winter temperatures plunging into the 20s in the Moab Desert, Danelle draws on her athletic training to help her survive the night. Despite a fractured pelvis, Danelle starts to do crunches to keep herself warm. It was almost like just use, lifting my head up, my head and my shoulders up. I couldn't do a full sit up because I didn't have any movement in my midsection. It takes a superhuman effort that's almost too much for her. And then I started to fatigue and I was, I became tired and I said to myself, I gotta find a pace that I could maintain through the entire night. Donnell forces herself to do one sit up every five seconds, nonstop over the next six hours. It's an extraordinary challenge, but it's the only way she'll stay alive. I knew if I fell asleep, I would have died of hypothermia and I knew if I stopped doing the crunches that I would have died of hypothermia. In an incredible feat of physical endurance and mental stamina, Danelle wills herself to survive in freezing conditions. When most people would probably have given up, Danelle has made it through the night by doing sit-ups. In the morning, she has no time to rest. She intends to crawl her way two miles back to her truck. My plan was to take that gel to give me some energy and then to continue to crawl out. I thought that it would be no problem for me to continue dragging myself. And what I didn't know is that, that the adrenaline had gotten me through those first five hours right after the accident. Danelle is in for a terrible shock. The adrenaline that protected her has completely worn off. Now, if she's to survive, she must face her ordeal with no defense against the pain flooding throughout her body. When I tried to move, it was just throughout my whole body, just this excruciating pain. And on top of the physical pain was the mental pain of being stuck there. I would have rather had 20 people around me hitting me with a hammer. That would have been better than what I was going through. Ah! 
And that's when I started to think, somebody's got to notice that I'm missing. I thought, maybe somebody will notice my truck is still parked there. But as she lives alone, no one is looking for Danelle. No one knows she's missing. She is completely alone. It's nearly 24 hours since her devastating fall, and Danelle is facing a new danger, dehydration. I was aware of how dangerous it can be to get dehydrated. With her fresh water supply gone, only a small puddle by her side is helping her stay alive. But it was really a struggle to drink from that water source. It was hard to get the water into my water bottle and into me. Um, there was a lot of silt in it. While water can help keep her alive, it also carries a risk. I didn't want to drink too much because if I peed on myself, then the risk of hypothermia would have been worse because it was so cold out there. Urinating would wet her clothing. In the bitter cold, it would freeze, speeding up the onset of hypothermia. Only Danelle's willpower has prevented it from already happening. As the day wears on, the risk posed by the bitter cold lingers. But a new threat emerges. Inside her body, Danelle's injuries have taken a lethal turn for the worse. I started to feel this inflammation in my midsection. And it was kind of soft and squishy. And I remember if I tried to move, this whole jelly roll would sort of move, almost like a water balloon or something. I remember thinking at the time, oh, it's, it's inflammation. It's not inflammation. It's far worse. Danelle's shattered pelvis has severed blood vessels in her pelvic cavity. She's been bleeding internally for a day and a half, starving her brain and other major organs of the vital oxygen they need for her to survive. Danelle is bleeding to death. Unable to move, and facing another night in freezing temperatures, Danelle is finding it much harder to stay in control. She struggles to do her sit-ups. Worse still, she's beginning to hallucinate because of her blood loss and fatigue. I remember looking it up to the stars and instead of them being these vivid stars where I could see the Milky Way, all I could see was these stripes in the sky. The second night was a lot harder. That first night, Taz kind of cuddled up next to me, and the second night, he, he didn't want to. He would come and check on me, but he didn't cuddle up next to me. He just kind of looked at me like, you know, what are you doing laying there? But I don't think he knew what to do either. You know, he probably was, maybe he was thinking, you know, should I leave and go get some dog food, you know, and take care of myself, or should I stay here with her? I think Taz knew something was wrong then. His demeanor had changed a little. He seemed a little bit depressed. He seemed kind of frustrated that I wasn't taking him to his doggy bed. He wanted to, to continue on back to the house. And uh, he kept looking at me like, come on, let's go to a more comfortable spot. 
second night felt a lot colder to me, too. Um, felt long and cold. What Danelle doesn't realize is that the cold is keeping her alive. Her core body temperature is now so low that her metabolism is slowing dramatically. Her blood pressure is dropping, which in turn is slowing the internal bleeding. The cold is delaying the worst, but Danelle is already living on borrowed time. As the night wears on, Danelle is fighting for her life. It's taking every ounce of willpower to avoid drifting off to sleep, where the onset of hypothermia would lead to certain death. I remember wanting to be at home in my bed where it was warm and comfortable and uh, where I could sleep. I had been awake this whole time and I was starting to get the sleep monsters where I wanted to sleep, but I knew I had to stay awake. <sighs> and I still kept hoping somebody would notice that I was missing. The reality of the situation was that I was in the middle of nowhere and nobody knew where I was. Thanks to her endurance training and extraordinary willpower, Danelle has survived a second night in the freezing winter desert, where most people wouldn't have survived one. But it's unlikely she will survive another. Three pints of blood have seeped into her pelvic cavity, and she's becoming much weaker. On that lump around my midsection, it was blood. I couldn't see it because it was all internal, um, but I was losing a lot of blood. I didn't want to die, and I had to get out of the canyon, and nobody knew where I was, so I tried again. And I, I was determined to just to fight the pain and to try again. Two days after she set out on her run, several phone calls from Danelle's family and friends have finally alerted the police to her disappearance. Morning, Frank. What do you got there? I got a possible missing persons call yesterday. I went out to the house this morning to check it out. Lights are on, laptops on, trucks gone. No signs of activity for a couple days, at least. I know her. Danelle Ballinger, the uh, marathon runner. She trains up around Amasa. As a matter of fact, I'm heading up that way right now. I'll take a look around. Let me know if you find anything. I will. Oh, maybe I made it about three inches, and I got myself stuck in this small, wasn't even a, a pothole. It was just a, a change in direction in the rock, and I couldn't even barely get myself out of it. With little blood-borne oxygen reaching her vital organs, Donnell's body is close to shutting down. It's only her extraordinary physical conditioning that's keeping her alive. But she won't live much longer without medical help. And she knows it. I was hyperventilating, I could barely breathe. And I also starting to lose my vision. I would turn my head to look, and, and it would just sort of uh, be this blur across the sky. And then I would have to focus on something in order to sort of get my vision back. Barely able to see, 
Donnell can go no further. Defeated, she spends a painstaking three hours inching her way back to her only source of water. 50 hours after her dramatic fall, the adventure athlete's hopes of getting out of the canyon alive now seem futile. I got myself back into this spot and I just laid on my back and started crying and uh, I started to lose hope. And Taz came over to me and was just licking my tears. And I was so sad that I wasn't gonna get, I didn't know what was gonna happen to Taz. There was not gonna be anybody to take care of him. I was gonna miss not being able to play with Taz, miss be being able to run with him and do the things I love to do. And that's when, still can't talk about it. Local detective Craig Shumway knows that Donnell often trains in the Amasa back area, north of Moab. He's hoping his hunch pays off. Bingo. Now a search and rescue operation can be launched, but it may already be too late for Donnell. Within an hour of the discovery of Donnell's truck, the Grand County, Utah search and rescue team mobilizes. Donnell's been missing over two days, and they know any hopes of finding her alive are fading fast. Okay, we've got a missing person's potential injury in the Amasa back area. John Marshall is in charge of the search team out in the field. Our organization is set up that individual officers take turns being the officer in charge on any particular day. That day just happened to be my day. Female, brunette, about five foot four, 120 pounds, name Danelle Balengi. Balengi? You know her? And instantly in my mind, the story completely changed. We're not looking for a lost tourist, somebody who just wandered off the trail. We're looking for somebody that's got more backcountry um, experience than <laughs> your average John Doe on the street. And if this person's been missing in the backcountry for two, two and a half days, they're not just lost. This person is in some serious trouble. While critically injured, and exposed to freezing conditions. Donnell's endurance training has helped keep her alive for over two days. But the physical ordeal is wearing her down mentally. I was pretty close to dying at that point. And I had lost hope that anybody would find me. Now, after 51 hours, her intense willpower is breaking down. Despite increasing risk of hypothermia, she can no longer stop herself from urinating. With night bringing colder temperatures, Donnell knows that without a miracle, she'll likely freeze to death by morning. The extreme athlete has finally given in. That's when I started to think about my life and everything that I did. I started to think about my life and everything that I did and everything that I still wanted to do. And I thought about my family and my friends and how much they meant to me. And I, I thought I was gonna die. I mean, I was, I was dying. Yes. Need you to help me. Taz was there with me, and he was all I had at that point. And I, I said to him, I said, Taz, I'm hurt. I need help. Can you go get help? Taz, I need you to help me. Go get me help. 
Des, go find some help for me, please. Go. This is my last chance, Tess. <laughs> And he turned around and he took off. Taz is her only hope. But Donnell knows that by sending him away, she may now face death alone. With little time to spare, Moab Rescue Operations Chief John Marshall arrives at the Amasa backcountry search area first. The backcountry here in southeastern Utah doesn't play any favorites. It's a beautiful, awe-inspiring landscape, but it also is deadly. There's a dog down there. You see him? Yeah, I got him. Taz has found his way out of the canyon and is heading towards the search party. But as he races towards them, John fears the worst. I know my dog will never leave my side as long as I have a pulse. So to see her dog down in the bottom of the canyon for the first time, my heart dropped. It says, ah, oh, this can't be a good sign. The dog has left its master. As the rest of the search party arrives, Taz reaches the top of the canyon. But he doesn't stop, and his behavior is bewildering, particularly to experienced tracker, Bego Gerhardt. This bedraggled dog came running down the Jeep road and right through us. The odd thing was he didn't really want anything to do with us. Like, he didn't walk up to the first person and go, feed me. John Marshall knows that Taz could hold the key to finding Donnell. But standard procedure dictates that he cannot delay the rescue operation any further. Bago, you take the massive back trail and the ATV. Bago Gerhardt is under no illusions about the enormity of the task facing them. It's usually you're going to look for somebody that's just out after dark or they broke their ankle and you pretty much know where they are. But this was a full on search, had no idea within say 20 square miles, which is huge in this country with all the canyons and cliffs. 20 square miles can take a long time to cover. It's time they simply don't have. As evening approaches, temperatures are already dropping. But Bago Gerhardt can't rush for fear of missing a clue that may lead him to Donnell. As we went up, every time there was a sandy place, I'd look in the sand for tracks. And pretty soon, I thought I found some tracks that could be two days old. And there were dog tracks along with the shoe prints. Back at the search and rescue base, John is now sure that Taz is trying to tell them something. This dog was on a mission. So it's almost as he, as if it ran around to say, hey, look at me, look at me. I'm going to get everybody's attention. Now I'll show you where she's at. Where is he going? All of a sudden, down in the bottom of the canyon, the dog reappears and headed back up the Amasa back trail. So I get on the radio, and I radio over to the, uh, the vehicles heading up the trail. 1T812 to 1T836. Hey, Bago, looks like the dog's coming your direction. Let him pass. Let's see where he's going. I'm looking over my shoulder. And sure enough, Taz appears and takes off up over the hill. 
I'm going, you know, I think I should follow Taz for about five minutes just to see. Okay, dog. Let's see what you know. Time is running out. As nightfall approaches, a new threat to the rescue operation has emerged. Heavy snowfall is forecast, which Donnell couldn't hope to survive. Following Taz may now be the last chance of finding Donnell alive. Experienced mountain tracker Bego Gerhardt knows that Donnell's dog could be her only real hope of survival. I know to pay attention to to dogs because they they know stuff. So when he when he ran up over the hillside, I had a very strong feeling of I better follow him for a few minutes. As Taz leads Bago deeper into the canyon, the going becomes more treacherous. Bago must slow the ATV and risk losing the dog's trail. Donnell has no way of knowing that Taz has found help. She is resigned to dying out in the open. But when he returns, Donnell senses a change in his behavior. Next thing you know, Taz came up and he came right by me and he went straight to the puddle and he started drinking from my puddle. I remember thinking, that's my lifeline. That's the only water I got. Can't you find a different puddle, Taz? But I couldn't. You know, I couldn't say that to him, and I just, I just pet him a few times and let him drink from the puddle. And his demeanor had changed a little bit. He had seemed to get a little bit of energy back. And then he licked my face again, and he was kind of wagging his tail a little bit. And I, it was sad for me to see him, see this happy little dog that I was never gonna be with. At the same time, I heard this other sound. I wasn't hopeful because I had been screaming help for, you know, for 50 some hours straight and nobody had come to, to help me. Help! And just about the time I thought I was gonna run out of road, I heard this blood curdling scream. Help! I'll never forget it. And uh, had to be Danelle. The sound got closer, and the engine cut out, and I start begging, desperate begging for help, explaining that I'm hurt, telling this person, you cannot leave. I need help. I need help. Help, help, please help me. It was the best moment of my life, because I knew right then that I was gonna get a second chance. I knew I was gonna make it. And it was quite emotional because not very often do you go on a rescue where somebody's life is really quite on the edge. The look on her face was one of relief and then the tears came. Next thing he said to me was, you got one good dog. And I just started crying. I just laid there and started crying. I don't think any human could have survived another night in those temperatures. Taz's extraordinary bond with Danelle has saved her life. Taz certainly did make the difference in shaving hours or perhaps even days off of finding Danelle. And in this rescue, she didn't have hours or days to spare. She was on the brink as it was. I knew Taz was a smart dog, but to be able to do what he did, this was a whole nother level of communication. Suddenly, you know, my, my dog was taking care of me instead of me taking care of him. You know, I look back on it now and I'm so, so grateful. He's truly a best friend.
Donnell is airlifted to hospital and undergoes emergency surgery to repair the severed vessels that have pumped three pints of blood into her pelvic cavity. Then there's a six-hour operation to pin her shattered pelvis back together. It's touch and go whether she'll pull through. When we get the reports back of to her medical condition and all the doctors were saying, <laughs> she sure really shouldn't be alive with the massive amounts of blood loss that she had, the hypothermia, the frostbite, everything combined, she should have been dead days ago. But here it is two and a half days later and she's smiling. But there's another shock waiting for Danelle when she gets to see her feet for the first time in three days. Laying there in the hospital bed and they had taken my shoes off and I finally got a glimpse of my feet and uh, they were black uh, from frostbite. Every single one of my toes and then part of my foot was black. You know, with frostbite, you just have to give it time and eventually over the next 24 hours, slowly but surely, the color started to come back in my toes, my feet. And uh, so I knew I was gonna, I knew I was gonna be able to, my feet were gonna be okay. The prognosis for Danelle's fractured pelvis was not so reassuring. The doctor said that the injuries in my pelvis were pretty extensive, so I didn't know if I was gonna be wheelchair bound the rest of my life or if I was gonna be able to walk again. Her life has been saved, but her body may be shattered beyond repair. Doctors fear she may never walk again. Against all the odds, the extraordinary determination that kept her alive in the canyon has now put her back on her feet again. After six hours in surgery and months of rehab, Donnell is up and running. I'm still able to do what I love to do. Um, it took, it's taken several months of recovery and rehab, um, but I'm back out running again, running the trails. Taz and I go out um, almost every day and Taz as a new playmate. My son, is he's really a gift, and every moment with him, I, I appreciate. And I think I appreciate him even more, knowing that you know, he may have never been if it wasn't for Taz and all the people that you know, were there to help me survive that experience.